So sitting next to me are um, Leon and Maya, who are the two scribes who actually wrote these incredible cases. And if you didn't get a chance to read them, hopefully you'll, you'll read them and share them after this. And, I, and I, um, I requested that we do this session partially because I wanted to develop a, a, an appreciation for how much work went into these cases, but also to take advantage of, of um, all the knowledge in their heads. So to jump in, if you could both just quickly introduce yourselves and give us a quick sense of your background. My, my. All right, sure, I'll start. Um, so I've been working at ISS for three years on uh, land and property rights for the last year or so, but before that on a wide variety of issues, um, everything from preventing deforestation to judicial reform to public works. Um, and prior to that, I worked in Kenya for the International Rescue Committee, and uh, I studied comparative politics at Princeton. Uh, great. Um, so I'm, I'm Leon Schreiber. Um, I'm actually based in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, technology can do amazing things these days. Um, despite being based there, I've worked with ISS for about two years now. Um, prior to joining this project, also about a year ago, um, most of my work focused on the Ebola response in West Africa, specifically Liberia. So uh, we did a series of cases on, on that um, fascinating story. Um, I also worked previously on how to make power sharing cabinets actually work together in post-conflict settings. Uh, so that's very far from land administration, but um, you know, that's one of the great things about this job is that it really constantly challenges you to learn new things. Um, before joining ISS, I did a PhD in political science at the Free University of Berlin, and prior to that I studied at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, uh, all in political science. Impressive. So you both have rich backgrounds before getting into writing these cases. And, I, and I'm curious, from those different perspectives, when you got into land and property and you produced these documents, what, what struck you about this area of, of um, tenure and land reform? So for me, having spent two years working on a whole range of different issues through the same process of writing case studies, uh, what stood out when I started getting into the land administration side of things was how many components um, I was about to have to deal with, uh, in especially writing cases on managing land registries effectively. So things like restructuring an institution or um, improving performance management or developing a digital system are things that we you know, could write an entire case study about just one of them. And so finding ways to cover all that ground and uh, for me to wrap my head around it and then to make it accessible to readers was certainly an interesting and challenging process. And uh, I'm very grateful to all of the people who I interviewed who helped make that as smooth as possible for me. <laughs> yeah, um, so what's interesting is that um, practically Maya and I ended up sort of focusing on slightly different elements of this bigger story. So. So she was uh, working a lot on the setting up the registries and the agencies, uh, and I ended up working more on sort of the practical titling out in the field type uh, cases. And, and yet I share a lot of the same sentiments. I was really struck by how many issues are involved. Mm -hmm. You know, it's obviously focused and defined, and, 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 and that's the focus of the case, but it really cuts across so many different elements and, and one of them is, is just how political all of this is. Um, I think one of the key things uh, to keep in mind is that land is often the most valuable resource in many of these especially poorer countries. Um, it's the one thing that the state can leverage for different purposes, good or nefarious. And, and therefore, the, the political stakes are often very high in any sort of technical solution or proposal uh, needs to sort of take that political reality into account mm -hmm. when coming up with, with solutions. So I think that's something that stands out. Right. And can you just talk a little bit about the process? So maybe just pick one case and give a sense of like how many interviews, how much research, and, and right. how much internal review to get yeah. these. So I, I mean the process generally kicks off um, with sort of a background paper on, on what the series will focus on. Um, and then that obviously that involves sort of refining it down to how many cases, mm -hmm. which ones we want to focus on. Um, I know for this case, Maya and Jennifer actually did a lot of that uh, more than I did. 
Um, but I can certainly speak about once we've sort of zoomed in on a specific case or topic. Um, generally, the preparation begins with, with what we call a pre-trip briefing. So this is a, a meeting where we get together staff from all, all of the staff from ISS, basically. And we'd really dig into the background of this issue. So um, if we take the, the Mozambican case, you know, what is in that beautiful law that, uh, that, that the country has adopted? Um, uh, why are there cer certain challenges in, in, in why it's not perhaps being implemented as, as the government would like? And, and, and then sort of teasing out what should be the key questions. Uh, then obviously you go to the, the, to the country, you interview, we try to get to about 25 people in two weeks. Mm. So uh, it's, it's quite an quite a intense um, process. Uh, and then I would say it's, it's really quite organic in, in the actual discussions you have. You obviously have the, the issues you want to touch on, but there's definitely a human touch. It's not a mechanical process mm. when you speak with someone because people are different. And in, I think something to keep in mind in this type of work is that you know, you're going around the world Cultures are different, people are different, societies are different. And finding your feet in that whole process during interviews, I think, is one of the great learning experiences and challenges of the job. Um, and then, obviously, the writing comes after those two weeks in the field. Again, a very collaborative process. We usually go through about six drafts where you know, the whole team would have some input on that. So. Yeah. Anything to add? I think Leon's given That's you pretty a pretty good. comprehensive <laughs> view of our good. process. <laughs> so, so if I think about that, inter 25 interviews, all these topics, the background papers, and then we just have these nice, beautifully edited 20-page cases. What's on the cutting room floor? Like, if you had the time, what are, what are the issues that you would, would really relish the chance to jump into and push forward? Uh, so one... Um, Thing that I think has come through a lot in the discussions today is how fundamental property rights are to a developing economy, mm -hmm. but the fact that it's not going to automatically transform um, your economy. There's a lot of additional steps going forward in terms of accessing credit or capacity building so that people can use those rights, as well as maintaining an effective register so that it stays up to date and people continue to be in the formal system after a titling project. And so we've seen some of those efforts in, um, that the speakers presented, but I think that's an issue mm -hmm. that it would have been fascinating to dive into, where are there examples of sort of these linkages um, or what makes it difficult to run a program with that comprehensive of a view. Mm -hmm. um, that's one that I think is maybe s someone can pick up the ball from here. Mm -hmm. um, Another specific one that um, was touched on in the discussion, um, especially with Australia and uh, Canada, is the nature of uh, indigenous land rights within sort of a Western system. Um, I found that discussion in Australia mm -hmm. fascinating, and I would have loved to get into that much more than I was able to. Yeah, I actually think that that's one of the sort of, sort of shadows hanging over a lot of this is is how do you actually accommodate, integrate customary law with what's on the statute books? And, and I know there is, there is research about this out there, so it's, it's not necessarily a novel idea. But in writing these cases and trying to document current experiences, you find that it's still something that in many places goes unanswered. Um, it's, it's a very political, very difficult thing for many governments to find this social legitimacy of traditional customary systems of land administration and of basically, you know, broader administration in a local community and how you marry that with the statutory and with what are very often very progressive laws um, which make it tough to integrate systems where it's patriarchal sort of chieftainship. So mm -hmm. I think these are issues that we need to confront head on. Um, I think another one that links with that that, that came up is especially when it comes to communal um, titling efforts. Uh, th there is this, and I, and I, I think in Mozambique it's, it's very well, it's nicely illustrated. I think it does play a very big role when a community gets this ID card w that says this is the community. You know, you take up your citizenship. There's, there is something really powerful to that. But I think we should also keep in mind this, this idea of, of ethnicity and to what extent are we asking people to self-define on some kind of ethnic identity, saying we are the community, this is our land, 
and you end up defining yourself, perhaps, in contradiction to neighboring communities. So it's just something that, that sort of um, came up that I think is really interesting. And I'm not sure how much of that is, is currently being looked at. Interesting. Um, OK. I, I want to make sure the audience gets a chance to ask you questions. So I won't, I won't dig into those right now. But um, at Future Property Rights, our focus is, is tech and property rights and, and the different ways we can use tech. I mean, tech's not a panacea. but how can we use tech to collapse the time and the cost to, 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 be, to, to remove those barriers so we can spend more time on these other interesting media issues because there are so many things that touch it. So just any reflections on technology and land rights, things you saw that gave you hope, things you saw in country A where you're like, oh, maybe they should try that in country B. Yeah. Be always curious to get people's perspective. Sure, so having worked on uh, the set of cases where sort of computerizing systems played mm. a major role, I think uh, one of the lessons that all three of um, those speakers kind of drew out today was the importance of really preparing to do that, um, preparing your people, um, reviewing the business processes, and not just slapping a new computer system onto something that still needs improvement as a manual process. And I think um, you know, in all three of those cases, people learned that that was fundamental and that there were major sort of efficiency gains in just doing those process reviews, for instance, with survey checking in Jamaica. Um, the way it was described to me, it was, um, it used to go from point A to point B, back to point A, point, <laughs> point C, back to point A, and so on, and just making that process a linear one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without introducing any technology drastically cut the time. Right. And then you can put computerization on top of that and make further gains. But had you computerized this sort of spokes on a wheel process, mm -hmm. uh, you'd still be contending with that now. And so I think um, while technology can do a lot, um, it doesn't stand on its own. Right. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And so on the positive side, um, I think you know, in the Tanzanian case, we had this mass pilot project um, where basically people were using mobile phones, smartphones, mm -hmm. to do some of the surveying, um, physically walking the, the boundaries, local people trained actually to do this. Um, and, and that's one area where I do think that um, you really can save a lot of, first of all, time and, and potentially also money. Uh, because something that came up uh, across the cases is the lack of capacity when it comes to surveyors. Um, you often have to wait for someone to be seconded or come in from the private sector. It's very expensive. You have to pay for per diems out in the field. You have to put them up in hotels. Um, so, so to borrow a phrase from the Australian case, I think this is, is, is ready for disruption. Mm. Um, and, and obviously, you'd have to think through very carefully sort of the standards and how you monitor and implement this. But that's one area where I do think that there's a lot to be gained. Um, on the other side, though, I, I agree with Maya that it's, there, are very, there are many areas where we should perhaps wonder first, like, are there other reforms we need to make before we, we go into the technology that, that could potentially be cheaper, easier, and, and yield even greater results? And, and, and another issue that, that did come up is if you're going to build if you're going to build a digital register if you're going to go that route then you you have to think through long term after that register is up and running who has the license for maintaining that software what if something goes wrong because in, in frankly in many of these countries you're going to need help from the private sector they're going to need to be in a partnership to get these systems up and running. But then building the capacity within the government and, and making sure that there are no licensing issues that prohibit them from fixing an issue or updating that system as technology evolves, I think is something to keep in mind. So you know, if you sit down and, and plan this, I think you really have to be careful ab about thinking very long term. So you kind of anticipated my next question. I mean, if we think about the, the Tanzania, Mozambique, South Africa cases, you know, they're figuring out rights, delineating them, saying this is this person has this right to this space. And then you think about the registry cases, much bigger, private enterprise driven off fees. How do you bridge that? How do you, to, to make it simple, 
is what we learned about in Jamaica and, and Australia and um, Canada applicable to the African context? Do you think it's, it's imaginable you could take the software as a service from Australia, not that I'm doing a sales pitch for Jody, and, <laughs> and, and, and a private enterprise and, and do a PPP in Tanzania or Kenya? I mean, wh or if that's not appropriate today, maybe it is, um, what are the things they should be thinking about now in the way they design what they do have mm -hmm. so that it, it, it can scale or, or yeah. be digitized? Well, one thing that I think has come out um, as Leon and I have sort of worked together mm -hmm. on these cases is that the two are very fundamentally intertwined. Right. You can't really think about registry and tenure mm -hmm. separately. Um, when we've looked at countries that have made a push to um, formalize tenure rights, mm -hmm. in order for that to really be meaningful in the mm -hmm. long term, you need an effective registry that uh, people can access easily that's not uh, you know unaffordable or too burdensome so that those rights will stay updated um, that's been a challenge in a number of contexts where there's inheritance and people will split up their land right. or people won't go back to the registry to uh, formalize a sale and so making registries um, easily accessible and technology can be a part of that mm -hmm. um, especially in the longer term um, means that those tenure rights will be usable. And at the same time, um, these sort of market-driven uh, registries that we saw in the Jamaica, Western Australia, and Ontario cases really rely on the existence of a fairly active, um, formal real estate market. Um, you know, these agencies are supporting themselves through transaction fees, so there need to be transactions, and there needs to be a level of economic activity that supports the ability to pay those fees. And so I think integrating um, the sort of formalization of tenure rights with broader economic development in infrastructure, in the business environment, um, then leads you to a point where the market can support the kind of registries that we looked at in Australia and Jamaica and Canada. Got it. I think that's, that's very well put. Um, mm -hmm. Basically, all I would add, uh, or, or maybe just emphasize again, is that the technology or the, 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 the partnership itself is, should in no way be seen as something that can substitute for sort of the grunt work of building the institution. So if, if, you're, if you want to have registry offices out in, in sort of main cities in rural areas of Mozambique or Tanzania, you need to actually have the human capacity in those offices to manage whatever kind of system you, you decide to put in place, to manage the partnership that comes with the private sector, uh, uh, with a PPP, basically. So, so all I would really add is to say that um, let's not sacrifice emphasis on building institutions and, and taking that long view of the training and the capacity building um, sort of as a, as a price to pay for, for what may seem like easy fixes, because I don't think they're out there. Right. So I'm going to ask one more question, and I'll throw it up to the audience. I, one of the things that New America we like to do is, is get very smart people in as fellows. Maybe you two would be a fellow. <laughs> and and we'll have talk. them write things that, as, as Anne-Marie likes to say, it, are, 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 read, are readable by, by anybody, you know, mm -hmm. books you would want to read. So if, if you came in, you passed all those cool books, which were all written by fellows. And the, the challenge with land is that it's so nuanced, and as Peter Bradley said this morning, there's, there's so many complexities. <laughs> See, exactly. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Peter, Peter gets that That's a lot. Genius. So there's so many nuances that um, it's hard to write books and engage people and, and, and get people to really get excited about property rights yeah. until they lived it, until they've heard some of the yeah. stories we heard today. I mean, you're both very good professional writers. So if you were to write a book about this, how would you, what, what would you, what would, what would the subject be? Well, how would you get people to realize that even though this does take decades, not years, and there are no quick fixes, mm -hmm. this is terribly important and it affects people's lives and it can change the course of a country and, and this is something we, we need to invest in and think about. Mm -hmm. so, so I think something that, that, that's really unique about the cases that, that ISS writes is this idea of putting the reformer sort of in the driver's seat. Mm. So making the story about real people. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a technique or an approach that you could extrapolate. Um, I don't know 
how far you could take it if you're going to write a really substantial book that gets into some of the technical issues. But making it human and showing how these seemingly technical issues affect people in real life, yeah. I think is one of the key things to get people interested. Because anyone can understand, you know, sorting out inheritance after a, a, a parent has passed away. And if it's complete sort of uh, confusion about what this inheritance looks like, you know, who owns what, where is the land. I think that's something we could all very easily relate to. And, and that's, that's potentially one part of, of what such a book could be like. So mm -hmm. trying to humanize these stories, I think, is, is one key uh, part of it. Yeah, yeah and I think um, the interview-based approach, um, personally, I'm a very sort of practical person. I, I don't like getting into too much theory. Mm. Um, you know, you need something concrete to draw people in. And wh when I'm doing interviews, one of the things that, you know, you hear someone say it and you just go, oh, I know, I'm putting that in the case. Mm -hmm. um, is when people describe in very vivid terms the problem. Um, so, you know, we can say that land rights are fundamental to, you know, a functioning economy. But, uh, like, when I heard Elgin say, you know, we have people lined up in tents outside the office, yeah. it's just a lot more real. Yeah. And um, when you, you know, we focus on sort of solutions or progress, mm -hmm. and I think that, too, is... Um, something that maybe this space needs a little more of because uh, we've, I think we've all read enough sort of weighty yeah. depressing things recently. Uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I, and I would just, I would just add yeah. that I think going out and speaking to people and getting these stories uh, is a great way to, to, to see just how real and, 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 and human the impact is. And I think that's the privilege of, of, of writing these cases is that we we, we get these big concepts and these, these difficult topics, and then you go out and you see, wow, this is what it really means. Um, and I'm sort of spontaneously reminded of, of, of all things the Arab Spring. I mean, uh, in Tunisia, uh, w the way this all began was someone who essentially had insecure property rights. I mean, I forget his mm. name. Was he, I think, or was some? Yeah. Uh, I, I, he ended up setting himself alight because he couldn't run his business. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't get a, a foot in the door. And that was all fundamentally because of insecure property rights. And a story like that as a, as a hook to get someone into this topic, I think, is, is important. Wow. That was a great answer. Um, it reminds me, I would, a commercial break before we take questions. Um, there's a website called thisisplace.org that does, that does these stories. They have reporters dedicated to a lot of these sort of stories, which if you, I'm sure this audience is familiar with it. But if you're not, it's well worth checking out. So are there any questions for these two? Diligent scribes, so I can keep going. Do we have a mic? Sure. Thanks, Maya and Leon. And it's really, uh, I agree with you, Mike, that it's really interesting to hear the backstory of how these case studies were developed and kind of everything that went into them. Mm -hmm. My question is about uh, dissemination. So. How do we get these amazing examples into the hands of the right people who can actually use them to make policy decisions or make business decisions or make political decisions, what have you? You know, and I don't know if it's fair to ask you this question, <laughs> but I'm just going to go ahead and ask it anyway because I've been wondering this all day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> who, who do you think are the right people who should be reading these case studies and aren't yet? And how do you think we can get them into those people's hands? So I don't want to uh, completely step on our agenda for day two, but um, one of the things that uh, the cases, you know, other cases ISS has developed in the past um, have been used for is in teaching in universities and essentially training, you know, people who are going to be making these policy decisions and giving them some examples to think about as they start their careers. And so that's one opportunity. Um, and of course, you know, this event is wonderful. Um, and this is a great audience of people who really are active in this space and um, can give us feedback and sort of this forms a basis of a dialogue. Um, but you know, I don't have perfect answers. I think we're also working on you know, developing different types of content based on this. Um, just because, you know, 
these days, you have to have so many different options to meet different people's needs and how they want to consume information. So mm -hmm. um, everybody check out the DevX Basic Live videos. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a really difficult issue, a difficult question. Uh, but I would, I, would, I would again agree and say it, it is a, a, a real privilege to have people in the room together here that you know, I, we spoke to in their place of work, looking at what is their passion in all these different countries. And to bring them together and to see the interaction between these people is already, I think, something that will add value to, to everyone. Um, and, and second of all, I mean, there's a lot of people here today, so maybe the interest isn't as low as we sometimes you know, imagine. It's, it's, it's more a question, I think, as, as Yulia asked, of, of getting it into the right channels. I think there's opportunities on social media. I think um, getting the stories out in a way that makes it clear that it's not going to be you know, the, the standard um, technical things, although that's obviously very important. I think s sort of a strategy around that um, more generally for stories like this, I think, is something that, that we can pursue. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think there are easy answers. We're all competing with, with you know, a huge amount of, of media out there today. So it's, it's a question that goes well beyond, I think, this specific forum. Going back to uh, Michael's question about uh, is there a book that, you know, could be, you know, very popular and easily read, the one that comes to mind is The Mystery of Capital mm -hmm. in Nana de Soto, but um, I and many other people are very critical of that book because it is, provides the silver bullet, but it oversimplifies everything. Mm -hmm. And so I want to congratulate you guys, you authors, on taking this subject that's sort of out of your you know, comfort zone and making it palatable and, and easily consumable, but not falling into the trap, the DeSoto trap. Mm -hmm. Somehow you manage to you know, navigate your way through that, and I think congratulations to, you, to the whole team here, because I think it's very effective. You got, the sim you got the simplicity of reading, but you caught the complexity of the whole, you know, the whole mm -hmm. area, so well done. Thanks. Awesome. In the back. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Scott Justo from Worcester Polytechnic Institute. I want to echo the, the comment that was just made. I came to the case studies uh, expecting to see something far less nuanced and uh, sophisticated around the deep complexities. Uh, uh, and uh, so I really appreciated that. I happen to have worked a lot in Monwood BC Park, uh, so I was pleased to be returned to that uh, um, story. And. Uh, one of the things that the cases uh, um, bring forward to me is the difference between urban and rural areas. And uh, in rural areas, the land often is the fundamental basis for uh, livelihood. Um, in urban areas, it sometimes is, but it's much more complex. Uh, people need a place to live, yeah. and they need a place to conduct business, uh, but they, um, and they want <laughs> security uh, of uh, tenure in some fashion. Uh, but I wonder if you uh, have thoughts about um, other bases for capital accumulation. You know, we have this, you know, long historical uh, basis around land and uh, um, uh, and if we focus overly much on land, are we sort of looking past some other forms of capital accumulation that we ought to be encouraging and that maybe, in fact, there might be some synergies between the two? Uh, you know, I think that's an excellent point and one that is maybe the next step for this um, because as Grenville very clearly pointed out, I, and I agree completely, titling isn't a silver bullet um, when you just give someone a land title and say, now you have the rights, now you can um, you know, form capital and invest, you know, that there are a lot of intermediate steps before you actually see the benefit. Um, and so I think um, the example that 
we heard about the sugar cane in Mozambique and mm. some of the other um, sort of more comprehensive uh, approaches. You know, I, I would like to see more work on that or maybe do more work on that um, and how you can you know, develop a framework that is cohesive and doesn't have too many moving parts um, so that you can in integrate not just land and then investment into the land, but um, especially in an urban setting, uh, security of tenure and other opportunities. Um, but I don't, I don't have you know, a clear cut answer for you, unfortunately. Yeah, I just think we, we talk a lot about dead capital, but we should probably also mention human capital. I think that's a huge part of this. Uh, in, in so many dimensions. So if we look at the, the institutions and, and actually managing a system, it's about people. I mean, that, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Uh, and, and having that relationship with communities, and, and, and I think crucially, whether it's technology or, or setting up a registry, getting local people to buy in and to actually become part of the system, I think is, is a hugely important uh, step. And, and that obviously applies beyond, I think, uh, property rights or, or registration. But it's, sometimes that it's, it's something that does sometimes get overlooked. I mean, you can easily sit in an office and have all these grand schemes and plans. But there could just be one small cultural or social nuance that you're unaware of, and, and then your whole registry may collapse. So, so, so I mean, Monwabisi Park, I think, is a good example of getting into the community, trying as much as possible to learn from them mm. about why is it that, you know, especially in South Africa, there is a formal registry that's working. The question is why are there so many people who are outside of it? And, and I think tapping into human capital to human experiences I think is the way that we could sort of broaden perhaps our understanding of what, of what the problem is even if you, if you want to go that far. Yeah. And I, I think it's a good time to mention, you know, we, this today was live stream, but we'll also be taking these talks and, and they'll be published up on the Princeton site and on the New America site, I think. Um, so that if you were to use these cases and you wanted somebody to, to hear Kathleen Ewing talk about the park and, and to show those before and after pictures, think of all the great presentations we saw today, just those slides of this, I took this picture and then three years later, here's a playground or here's a crash. It's like, ah, this is working, this is making a difference. Um, so those materials will be up. Um, and a question for you, back to the cutting room floor. Are there other materials you would put up? Or, or, that will, or that could be put up? I mean, I'm sure there's so much, if I were to want to teach a class, I want to give students background reading or preliminary reading yeah. to, before I introduce them to the cases. Yeah, I mean, um, it's hard to pull them off the top of my head having right. spent yeah. a lot of time with it, but um, I think there's a lot of sort of reports and laws and analysis that are not in the traditional academic literature just mm -hmm. yet. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see where people will go with it. Um, but you know, you spend several weeks uh, reading everything right. you can get your hands on um, for these bef to before you go into the field for these cases. Mm. And so, you know, a curriculum would ideally include elements of that as well. And I also want to add that um, we do transcribe and publish selected mm. interviews as well um, on the ISS website when there's. You know, someone in a key position who's just said one insightful thing after the next. Um, you know, that do, not everything always makes it into the cases, and so um, in those instances, there's a recording and a transcript where you hear someone, you know, telling their own story. And so I think that's a nice complement in a lot of instances to the cases that look, uh, you know, at the big picture of an institution or a program, and then you have, you know the story of that through one person's eyes or their component of it. I guess one piece of material that, that would be useful um, in a teaching context or, or, or maybe more broadly, uh, or certainly something that I found difficult in every case, is trying to get at what exactly is the theoretical system. So what exactly does Mozambique's land law say? What is the, what is the ideal scenario that it is actually painting? And obviously, if you go read the laws, you know, it's, it's written mm. as a law. It's not an engaging or accessible thing. So it's just something off the top of my mind that if you could, you know, if you could at least understand what is the theoretical ideal that we want, 
it could help when, it, when you go towards implementation so that everyone's sort of on the same page. So something basic that says, okay, so in, in, in this country's system, if I have a registered piece of land, what if I die? How does inheritance work? Who's eligible for this uh, sort of to inherit, or can it be sold? Um, mm -hmm. What does it mean when the president owns the land, but I have a title? You know, hashing out these sort of legal issues in a way that, that, that can be understandable, I think is something that could be helpful. Very cool. Time for one more question, if anybody's got one. Todd and, Todd and then Serafina. Serafina. Yeah, my name's Todd Miller. I'm with uh, Chromaway. We're a blockchain um, software provider. But I don't want to talk about the technology. I want to pick up something that Mike said about um, sort of contemplating systems that these sort of leading edge systems that we saw in Australia and Canada versus in the developing world. And I guess I had a question about, it's kind of about blockchain, but about the notion of consensus. And it seems that in these informal systems that are they, are, and I think Mike was maybe intimating this, that are they maybe incompatible with a computer system that's X or O, or one or zero? Mm -hmm. And is there a way that an informal system, which we heard some you know, fabulous presentations this morning about, that we need to th rethink about how our technology systems and things that are emerging now around consensus, I don't know, around artificial intelligence, but how we might be able to apply those to an informal system where it's really about consensus uh, rather than the law of the land, because we know in these countries that it's not as well defined. And I don't know if you had any thought about, were you hearing about in, in, in some of the case studies around, well, there is consensus about ownership, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's, a, it's a moving target that we have to be able to capture in that way. That was kind of a comment and a question, sure. I guess. I, so, so I would say that um, potentially technology could actually be, so, so, so the question is whether you want to document you know, that which is based on a social consensus. And in a lot of these countries, there is a movement towards at least sort of documenting what already exists, even if it's not creating a new right. And, and that's somewhere that where I think technology can be more agile than a paper-based system, right? Because, you know, if, if you write down today, this is, this, this is who owns what, and everyone agrees, that could change very quickly. And, I mean, I'm no te technology expert, but you could potentially have something that's way more flexible and, and, and could actually adapt to changing realities more. Um, but I would say that, and this is actually something that, that comes from the Ebola cases, uh, where technology was also something that was being introduced to try to address it, that, uh, just to give you an example there, they used an application in Liberia at some point, which, which was, um, of course this is in the context of an emergency, but this was the only sort of Ebola tracing application that was out there at the time, but it was designed in Uganda. So sort of importing the technology into this different context led to very basic problems like the name of the location where I'm at, you start typing it and a place in Uganda pops up, you know, and that completely messes up any kind of data system that you want to build. So again, I would say I don't think that it has to only be yes or no. I think there are a lot of smart people who can work with different options, but the key is to really get into how these social networks really work and operate and how that consensus is generated on the ground as you're developing whatever product it is. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, so I am also not an IT expert, but having you know, talked to the people um, who've developed some of these cutting edge systems, I am quite confident that they could put something together. Um, and you can envision a system that has um, you know, multiple people with different types of rights to the same piece of land that are all entered into a system. There's, you, know, you could envision layers on a map where this is community land, this is grazing land, this is you know, a parcel where someone's farming and they may overlap. Um, and I, I think to Leon's point, you can even you know, down the road see communities um, if they're the ones entrusted with a allocating these rights, updating things themselves. Yeah. Um, but I would just add that um, you know, access to the registry and uh, making sure that there is social buy-in mm -hmm. um, and that it's easy for people to go and update um, things in the register, whether it's 
you know, digital or paper-based um, is, I think, maybe one of the fundamental steps that um, we're seeing sort of being worked on um, in many of the developing world cases. I think social preparation is a concept that we can all yeah. really take to heart in, in different contexts, including this one. Great, and uh, join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you.